Okay, well, thank you, Wyatt, first of all, for inviting us. And if we have any scientists present, I'm going to talk about um, all nucleic acids as DNA, just as a convenient shorthand. Now, DNA is in everything. Uh, you may or may not know this. It comes as a surprise to some people that all the food they eat, everything you touch, leaves a trace of DNA. Of course, you're full of it. Every cell of your body is full of it. Um, your DNA is unique to you or somewhat unique to you. It's unique to a species. And any environment is cram-packed full of DNA, often in living things which are ageing, changing over time, and mo moving around. Uh, now, these days, if you were... Uh, in the old days, when people did ecology, let's say you're a marine biologist... You would go out, I remember doing this 20 years ago, you'd go out with a little square, you'd section an area, you'd take all the organisms and you'd look at them and you'd look at them up in a book and you'd say what they are and so forth. Some, some years ago I went to a, a more modern lab in America and what they were doing is they will now take a slice of coral reef, they will put it literally into a food blender and make a sort of seafood smoothie. They'll take a sample out of that and sequence everything that's in there and they will identify and count all of the things in that reef from that smoothie. That's the power of DNA. Now, DNA, obviously, it, it creates, you, you, as an embryo, your DNA contains a code, and that code uh, guides the way you grow. It guides what happens in your body. We all know this. It's well established. It's called the central dogma. What's not so well known is that DNA can change as well, and uh, it can respond to the environment. It can become modified. The cells in your body can have DNA that changes. Uh, certainly bacteria can evolve very rapidly and change over time. Now, when we decode a DNA molecule, I won't go into too much detail, but we can decode it into a form that can be read by a computer. And that decoding process is called DNA sequencing. And it's made tremendous strides in the past, uh, in the past 30 years and more certainly in the past uh, 10 years. Uh, DNA sequencing is now a very mainstream activity in all biological research. Uh, in fact, it's, it's enormous. Um, and more recently, people are starting to use DNA sequencing to answer questions, such as, as I said, identification, my, my example from coral reefs. You can track how things are changing over time because you can get an awfully large amount of information very cheaply. And again, more recently, people are looking at the status of an organism or a person by using the DNA to decide whether you're healthy or diseased. Now, uh, if you can think about, uh, if you think about uh, the blood vessels in your body, they're a kind of network. Um, they're moving around and all of your cells are bathed in a fluid. And cells die. They live and die. And when they die, typically they shed, they shed DNA. Uh, and the DNA in the different organs of your body can be somewhat distinct to the organs. And certainly for some diseases like cancer, the DNA can be very distinct. And it floats around. Uh, sort of like uh, information in a pipe. And the same applies to water supplies. The same applies even to uh, things like roads and subways. Um, and in a way, you can think about uh, DNA as uh, digital information moving through a tube. Now, if we can tap into that tube, uh, like a network, and we can read that information, we can intercept what's happening in near real time. And there are, it's not fantasy. There are some very good recent examples that are quite well, quite well known. It seems almost every week uh, a new, a new um, article appears in one of the mainstream papers these days on, on the use of DNA sequencing in prospective medicine. Uh, a good one that normally gets a sort of UR that you may have heard of is that you can now pretty much sequence the entire genome of a fetus from the, mother, from the blood of the mother. So as the fetus develops... Some cells die, the DNA goes through the placenta into the maternal blood, and you can detect fetal DNA in the blood. And that's being used for non-invasive testing for various genetic diseases, and some of those tests are starting to be approved now. But any disease, lots of other diseases will produce DNA that's characteristic for that disease, and that DNA can be picked up as what's called a biomarker and read. And here's a sort of poster child example. Uh, on the left here are chromosomes from a normal cell. You, again, from your high school biology, you probably remember your chromosomes. They've been coloured uh, differentially. On the right-hand side are chromosomes from a cancer cell. And you can see it's just utterly messed up. It's as surprising the cells are alive, actually, given how much change has gone on in that genome. 
And DNA sequencing right now, it's mostly done with quite large, these are DNA, these are DNA sequences, if you haven't seen one before. This is what they look like. The, the top left one is, is doing quite well. It's a very large box. The bottom right one is doing very well. And actually, I, I had a hand in developing the first version of the one on the bottom right. The one on the bottom right is the market leader right now. And most of these uh, devices are running in central laboratories. They cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. They cost quite a large amount of money to run. They require specialized staff. Um, you know, it's not a trivial un undertaking to sequence DNA, but the point is the machines produce tons of data. So a lot of centralized science is now being done through DNA sequencing. Uh, those are real scientists on the slide, by the way. Now, there's a new technology coming along. Uh, in fact, it's not a fantasy, it's already out there, and it's called nanopore sequencing. And all a nanopore is, it's a very small hole that sits on a silicon chip. And the silicon chip can read uh, what is happening in that little hole by measuring the flow of ions. And in the center picture, you can see DNA molecules that are sucked into these holes. And as they move through the hole very quickly, typically, we can generate an electronic signal that's characteristic for the DNA. Uh, and uh, so obviously this can read DNA from solution, and your blood is a solution, it's a liquid. But more importantly, uh, they can operate very, very quickly. They're orders of magnitude faster than the existing sequences. What that means is you can scan a liquid very quickly. You can do near real-time scanning of DNA or nucleic acids in liquids. Uh, now here is such a device. It's been a long time since I held this up first three years ago when we, we announced that we were making this. It's called MinION. And this is a DNA sequencer. It's a fun-sized DNA sequencer. Uh, and it's not a fantasy. It actually works. There are thousands of them out there right now under early access testing. Uh, and it's a nanopore DNA sequencer. So in here, we have an array of those little holes. They're 1.5 nanometers across. And if you introduced a sample with DNA in, the DNA would whiz through the hole, and we can read the DNA. So this is how you tap into that pipe. This is the sort of network sniffer for DNA sequences moving through a moving process. And again, the data stream is immediate. Uh, so we get complete molecules immediately, and that means we can interpret what they mean immediately. That's a very key difference. So where does that go? Well, there's been a trend in DNA sequencing, actually, to uh, centralize the laboratories and make larger and larger machines. It's very analogous to mainframe computing in the 60s and 70s. Um, and in, ah, some more sequences here on the bottom. That's, there's a fairly typical DNA sequencing lab on the bottom left there. Now, where this goes, we think, is more analogous to mobile phones. So the amount of power in here is enormous. In fact, I, Right now, this sequencer is starting to surpass those old boxes in terms of power. And I think later this year, we'll see the first sub-$1,000 genome, human genome, sequenced on this little device later in the summer. So obviously, being portable and USB-powered, you can run it anywhere. Anybody can run it anywhere on anything in principle. And that opens up mobile applications. And the point is, being a little cheap sensor, we can embed that sensor in a whole variety of places. We can embed it in fridges, we can embed it in toothbrushes. I do like that idea, personally. I'd like to have a toothbrush that sequences my DNA. You can embed it everywhere, including, of course, very traditional laboratory equipment. So what that means is DNA sequencing can become a ubiquitous sensing apparatus that can sample and test in real time all kinds of different living systems. So where might put them? Well, lots of examples. Food production lines, at home, farms, all kinds of different places we can start now to directly measure and monitor natural environments in real time. Now, that's not fantasy. This is actually being done right now. Uh, so we've had an early access program running for nine months with the devices. There's this uh, Italian scientist who goes off to the jungle and he likes frogs. For, I'm, I'm a biologist, by the way. I also like frogs. The trouble is they all look the same and he can't tell what they are. So he's been somehow sampling from these frogs without killing them, by the way. He samples from them, and he runs them on a min-iron, and he can, in real time, while the frog is looking at him, he can tell what species the frog is, and he's finding new species. Um, as I showed in a moment, it's being used for some very important human-directed health applications in places where uh, you know, the, the medical infrastructure is not that good. Uh, we have another user who's been tracking or identifying uh, kinds of wood turns out that timber uh, counterfeiting is a massive problem and you need to be able to identify, track and trace where your timber comes from. We also had a case, it was in Zhao's article actually, where uh, outbreaks have been monitored very quickly 
In other words, you can identify the pathogenic bacterium that's making the patient ill uh, in a food poisoning outbreak quickly enough to find the source and do something about it before it gets out of hand. Now, uh, this is just this week. Uh, the guy sent me a picture. They're in Guinea. They've been running minions in Guinea doing Ebola sequencing. And they get the answer within some minutes, about 15 minutes, I believe, per patient. Uh, on the bottom left here, we can see a section of Ebola sequence. This is DNA. This is what DNA information looks like, by the way, these letters. And we can see that uh, there's an A there. That's identifying a strain-specific mutation. And they're looking at tracking how that strain is spread, where it's come from, are there super spreaders, is it in the environment, and so forth. And they can start to think about acting while they have the patient sitting in the field hospital, which is very different. Now, where does that go? Let's speed up a little bit. So we, we've also formed a little startup, and the idea is that um, we can marry these sensors to the internet. Um, so for a long time now, there's been a trend towards what you all know as big data analytics. It started with stock, stock market. When the stock market became digital, you could uh, collate an enormous amount of dynamic information on stocks. You could relate that information to changes in the real world. You could use that information for prediction and for tracking and all sorts of uses. Well, our intention is to have these sensors everywhere and to do the same kind of thing, but for DNA sequence information, that is measuring living things in a way that's analogous to you, you might do with market or stock market information. Especially powerful if it becomes predictive and preemptive. And we call that Metricor, which is just a, a portmanteau of uh, measurement and blood. And you can imagine uh, sensors being hospitals, airports, at, at home, and you can imagine them streaming information and detecting things as they happen. Again, that's not a complete fantasy. Here's a little story. One of our employees has a horse. It gets respiratory infections quite a lot. And she sequenced it somehow. I'm not quite sure how. What, what goes in here and what comes out here, she sequenced. Uh, and in near real time, that's actually running there, she found uh, a well-known pathogen that causes respiratory infections in a horse. Um, and she was able to act preemptively and treat the horse and head off a serious infection that could have killed it. The other option there, by the way, would be the horse has had it because it's just going to get ill and die. So I'm not sure if the horse is smiling on the left-hand side there or is, is uh, that's fear. But either way, you can try to predict what's going to happen to the horse before it actually happens. There's a nice sort of uh, self-quant application for horses. But of course, it could be anything. And, and certainly viral outbreaks and other dynamic instances of biological problems are tractable. But the big one, the big dream that's probably most relevant to this conference, I think, is we would like to move towards cell quantification. That is, if you're at home and you have a device, and it might not be this, it might be something derived from this, that we're going to make a version that works on handheld mobile phones. I do like the toothbrush idea, actually. I don't think it's that silly. You can inventory and measure all of the nucleic acids in, in your blood. And nobody's done that before, really, uh, much. But you know, it, it's clearly theoretically possible. We can collate that data, and we can trend and track it. Now, people are doing that right now, as you'll see outside, with Fitbits and blood pressure and all kinds. It's all very good. I love it. Uh, there are even people now buying over-the-counter glucose monitors, and you can measure your glucose level. And you can say, well, mine is more volatile than my brother's, or I need to run more or eat less sugar. Well, I think there's a wealth of uh, information that's just streaming around the network of your body that we can intercept and we can use to preemptively change the way people live. The essence of self-quantification is feedback. Measure something, decide something, see what happens. And here's a whole new, very rich readout that will let you do that. So, uh, and and cost-wise, it's within the range of personal usage as well. That's where we're heading. But of course, that's just one application. As I said, I think there are less controversial ones, in, certainly in animal health, in food processing, retail, and elsewhere. So if you, take, if you can measure in real time, if you have these sensors, what's happening, in nature, in people, in flowing, changing biological systems. You can make them an extension of the internet. And, uh, you know, I, I have a thermostat at home that's on my iPad. I can change, I can warm the house up before I get home. People call that the internet of things. We call this the internet of living things. And with it, I'll stop. Pretty amazing vision, Clive. And it's not just a vision, it's pretty close. How soon do you think it is before RGP's governments are issuing these devices to the citizen? Well, odd, oddly enough, I'm, I wonder, we go direct to consumer. 
Uh, it's not a medical device. It's a self-quantification device. And uh, I think we could try to go directly to ordinary people without working through medical approval. That's not to say it can't be used for medical device type usage. It can do that too. But I think for self-quantification, as long as you're not offering diagnostic advice or other things, people are literally uh, driven by curiosity and comparative analysis, I think we can go direct to self-quantification first. I think that's quicker. But knowing data isn't the same as knowing what to do with it. How do you bridge, oh my goodness, I'm learning this from my DNA today, well, my uh, toothbrush, that, that what is, do I do with it? That is the question. And our view is if you get millions of people <coughs> collecting data and thousands of people looking at it, you'll figure, out, you'll figure that out as you go. Uh, as happened with stock market information over time. Uh, the other end of that problem is when you talk to uh, companies looking at these self other self-quantification devices that measure very simple things, they say, well, great, my heart rate's gone up. What can I do other than eat differently and exercise more? <coughs> so I think that uh, we'll have to figure it out as we go, is my view on that. And if there is an internet of living things, <coughs> is there a security concern if people who don't have great motives know the DNA of various individuals? I, I'm sure there are lots of logistical things that would need to be figured out, but the same applies to your Fitbit. The same applies to your, the location services on your mobile phone. These things are already out there by analogy, and we'll just have to work through them. Clive Brown, building the Internet of People. Thank you. Thank you.